think about the thing that you want most for Christmas. Go back as a kid. You remember some of those things you wanted most for Christmas as a kid? You guys, can you think back? Some of you that far? Uh, can you think back? Shout them out to me. What's some of the answers? What's some of the things that you wanted most at Christmas last when you were a kid? Anybody? A pass what? A password journal. As a kid? It was a 90s thing. It was a 90s thing. Wow. A password journal as a kid, right? Well, she had to be classified with the nerds. Because that didn't even, that wasn't even on my Christmas list. Of course, we didn't have password journals back then. Anybody else? What's something you wanted as a, as a kid? A bike, yeah, that's one of the all-time greatest gifts to receive at Christmas time is that brand new bicycle. I don't know about you, but I love it. You may love it as well. To go out on Christmas morning and see all the kids that got those new bikes, regardless of the weather, they're out there riding those bikes on Christmas morning, are they not? I love to see that. What's something else that maybe you got or you wanted as a kid for Christmas? Lincoln Logs. Who? Lincoln Logs. Lincoln Logs, yeah, that was a big thing. You're dating yourself there a little bit, Jim. I'm right there with you. <laughs> I, re I remember those Lincoln Logs. Anybody else? Baby uh, something right here. Baby alive. I can't. Baby alive. I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. Baby alive. Baby alive. Baby alive. Okay. Is that the one that would, you give it something to drink and it kind of messes up the doctors? Yeah, I, I think I remember those. Anybody else? Barbie. Barbie House. All right. Anybody else? Sega. Sega? Yeah, Sega. Sega Gen Gaming Systems. How many of you guys are gamers out there? We got a lot of gamers in the house. I can't see too many hands here, but I see a few that are gamers. And I, I was kind of into gaming as a dad with Tyler. I really wasn't into those as a kid or anything. I don't know if they had. Yeah, they did have them. Remember the little, uh, the little football handheld game that had three dots and you ran the one dot, and you bring him up, you bring him down, you bring him up, you bring him down, you bring him down, you bring him up. You guys remember that little football game? Man, I used to smoke that thing as a kid. I, da, 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 da. Of course, it all evolved from there. But I remember as a dad, one of the Christmas gifts that, that my son wanted was those uh, Nintendo 64, whenever that came out. At that year that it came out, we got that. And uh, so I thought, I'm going to get into gaming with him right here. So I kind of enjoyed that. We'd go in his room, and we'd, uh, we'd kind of build these different things. And then they came out with that game with, uh, with Madden. Was it? No, well, not Madden football. They came out with um, Blitz, NFL Blitz. You guys remember that game? On Nintendo 64, hands down the best video game ever in my book. And because they just had a few components and man, you could turbo yourself and power and blitz and all these other types of stuff. I loved it. Well, then that game got old for Tyler and he needed to evolve to the Madden games. And then the next system after that, what was the next system after that? Yeah, PS1, we got that one. I'm thinking, well, I'll still hang with him. And then all of a sudden, I'm not hanging with him. Now, he, I could handle him in Blitz, on Nintendo 64. It was kind of even. Matter of fact, I kind of dominated a little bit in that game, right? But then when we bumped up to the Madden game, he said, Dad, come in here. And I'm going in there, and I'm trying to learn. Now, at that time, you got all new system, all new controllers, and different, a, a thousand different ways. You can do combinations of buttons, right? Well, from the Blitz way, you just had like four or five little buttons. That's it. Now you got all these combinations. Well, I didn't know all those combinations. Of course, he did. I'm getting annihilated. I'm getting destroyed. I mean, at nothing. And I'm getting fr How do you do all? Oh, Dad, you push A and B and you do this and you do that and push this button and that button and do that. I, I can't do that. So that's, that was my last time really playing any video games because it goes so, com so complicated with all those buttons. But we've all wanted something for Christmas, and we've all looked back, especially in our, our, our child years, and we think about Christmas and what we want for Christmas. And let me see if I can get my slides to work right here. Here's something I want you to get right here. No matter who it is, what people would like to receive more than anything is hope. Hope is what everyone is longing for. Hope is what everyone desires. That's the one thing that they would like to receive more than anything. Now, when you think about hope, I want you to think maybe some about those big things. What are some big things that people hope for? Well, 
One would be the end of this COVID virus, right? I mean, for the last couple of years, we've all hoped that there would be an end to this whole pandemic, an end to people getting the virus, an end to people being hospitalized, an end to people dying as a result of the virus. That's kind of a big thing that we've all hoped for over the last couple of years was a, an end to that. We all hope, we think about some of the big things, we, we hope that... Uh, Our candidate gets voted in in whatever office that he or she may be running for. We kind of get caught up in politics of the world today, and we hope that our guy or our gal wins. Some of the other big things we hope for, uh, we hope for a, a good future for our children, right? Uh, for all of us as parents, we, we think about our kids and we hope that they will have a, a good future moving forward. What, what about some of the tangible things that we hope for? Well, some folks may hope for a bigger paycheck, right? Maybe they're pulling some overtime hours this Christmas season because they know the budget is going to be stretched a little bit. And so they hope for maybe a, a bigger paycheck. Maybe some are hoping for that promotion. Maybe you've tested for it. You've done all the service activities you need and everything. You want to put on that next rank. You want to have that next promotion. You want to advance to the next level, whatever it may be in your career. You know, those are some tangible things that that we hope for. I kind of made a list of these. Uh, Some folks hope for a new home, right? Uh, Maybe the home they're living in, they're working really hard to try to save up money to get into uh, a better home or a different home or a new home. And uh, maybe some are hoping for a new car. Maybe that car you have, it's on its last leg and you're just saying a prayer. Maybe Maybe that car that's not running good is keeping you close to Jesus, right? Because you're praying every day when you leave the driveway, Lord, help me get to point B in this car today. Uh, matter of fact, if you're like me, I had an old car one time when I would pull up to the gas station and I would say, hey, check the gas and fill it up with oil, right? I mean, it just kind of blew through the oil. And as I took off, that old, old 69 Ford truck. Uh, and that's what that thing did. I would just check the gas in that and fill it up with oil. Every time I went to the gas station, I'd throw the throttle down on that thing and smoke would just come out of the back of it. I mean, it was burning some oil like you wouldn't believe. So maybe you have a vehicle like that and Especially if you have a Ford, you probably do pray a lot. Just kidding, I'm a Chevy guy. Maybe you're praying for that, <laughs> praying for that new car. Maybe you're praying for good health. By the way, uh, we've got several that are very sick among us here in our church, and uh, and maybe they or even we are hoping and uh, for for uh, for good health. Let's continue to pray for uh, Marshall. Um, uh, Valandaham. He's having triple bypass surgery uh, tomorrow morning. I spoke with him on the phone. I'll be going to the hospital today to visit with him. Uh, let's pray for Bob Prescott. Just came through a, a major surgery. I went over and prayed with him prior to going in. I'm going over today to visit him in the hospital as well and, and uh, pray with him. So let's pray for his healing. Uh, continue to pray for Harold Woods. Harold had his major surgery and went over to visit with him as well. been praying for him and, and he seems to be doing a lot better. And so it's good to have Jamie and Naomi here today. Uh, but let's continue to pray for Harold uh, in our church. I feel like I'm missing somebody, Uh, but we got a lot of sickness in our church. So uh, let's pray. Barbara uh, had COVID and uh, I spoke with her this week and she's still testing positive, no symptoms, but we still want to pray for, pray for Barbara. So there's a lot of folks that are hoping for health, right? As we end out the year 2022 and as we go into the year 2023, that's one of the things that all of us are hoping for is to have good health. What about those individuals that may just feel lonely? Uh, maybe you're a military family and you've moved here and you're not connected to any family whatsoever and, and uh, maybe you just feel lonely at times and you're hoping for a companion or you're hoping for someone that can come in and, and just be a good friend for you. Uh, those are things that people hope for, maybe some more tangible things. People also hope for love, right? hope for respect. Uh, people hope to, to feel seen. Uh, sometimes you ever feel like you're the only one. You feel lonely in a crowd. I know everybody feels like that from time to time, and you just want to be seen. Oh, people hope for all types of things. A recent poll recently showed that most Americans remain somewhat hopeful about the future, but the poll, go, poll goes on to say that our hope is being tested every single day with suffering and division. And there doesn't seem to be a clear path ahead for the way to go for our country as a a nation as a whole, or even for our communities. There's just that, that you're wondering what is taking place in our world today. Here's something I ran across a a survey or actually an article that a, a psychologist wrote. And they wrote this and they tell us that hope is not a luxury. In fact, For mental health, hope is a necessity. 
I mean, hope is that big. For a lot of folks to experience good mental health, they have to have hope in life. Well, hope would be an incredible gift to receive. Would you not agree? To be able to say that, hey, I have hope. But many people are struggling in life today. I mean, you think about all the struggles that, that people face. They have the struggle of losing a loved one. They have the struggles of disappointment in our culture today. They have the struggle of difficulty that they're facing in what area it may be. They have the struggle of, of anxiety that they're feeling. They have the struggle of their finances, especially Christmas time kind of stretches people's budgets. And so they struggle in, in the area of finances. They struggle in the area of relationships. Relationships. You know, you're getting together with the family over the holidays from Thanksgiving to Christmas and, and New Year's. And, and sometimes there's some relationships that aren't going as good as we would hope for them to be. Folks are struggling in their careers. I mean, there's a lot of things that people struggle over. And in doing that, they lose their hope. So hope is certainly being tested. So with that in mind and all of that in mind and going into the holiday season... I want to try to preach this mini-series just simply entitled, The Best Christmas Ever. Question, what makes something the best ever, right? What is it that makes something the very best ever? Now, there's a running joke in my family. My mother-in-law, if you know her, if you spend any time around her whatsoever, she will use this statement. It will go something like this, that's the best I've ever had. Whether it's biscuits that she made or cornbread that she made or something that she has canned or something that she has done, she will often use this statement, that's the best I've ever had. That's the best I've ever had. And I always call her out and I say, really? Now how really is that the best that you have? Had. So now it's kind of a running joke and we laugh about it. She even now, she didn't even realize she was saying that all the time. I said, do you realize you say that all the time about everything? That's the best I've ever had. That's the best I've ever had. That's the best I've ever had. I said, do you realize you say that all the time about everything? I don't know if she's watching today. She may be getting mad at me right now for <laughs> saying this. But she's gotten to the point now where she'll say it and then she'll quickly look at me and say, oops, I said it. <laughs> but what makes something the best that we've ever had, right? Whenever you start thinking about the very best Christmas ever, what makes something the best that we've ever had? What characteristics come with something that exceeds your expectations? Think about that. What are the characteristics that come with something that exceeds your expectations? How does an event move from ordinary to extraordinary or extraordinary. How does it move to that? How does an event go from just an ordinary event to an extraordinary event? Well, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. This past Wednesday evening before Awana started, we pick up our grandkids, our granddaughters, uh, Quincy and Marlo. And we pick them up, we bring them to Awana. Now, Marlo's too small for Awana, but she hangs out with Debbie uh, sometimes, and then sometimes they take care of her. But we, we pick them both up, and then we go out to eat before we come to Awana. Now, this past Wednesday evening, we went somewhere we've been a thousand times, and you've been there hundreds of times yourself. We went to Cracker Barrel, right? One of the reasons, Quincy loves Cracker Barrel, and she loves pancakes, right? And so we said, okay, we'll go to Cracker Barrel before we go to Awana. Just an ordinary event. However, this ordinary event that we went to just this past Wednesday, had no idea this was going to work into my sermon this fast, but it did. Just an ordinary event turned into an extraordinary event. I mean, one of the best times we've ever gone to Cracker Barrel was this past Wednesday. It was extraordinary. It was off the chart. Now, let me tell you what happened. Let me try to paint the picture for you. And I got to be quick on this because I got a lot to say today. And I'm not sure I'm going to get through it all, but I hope and pray I can. What turned this ordinary event into an extraordinary event? Here's what happened. We walk in. Dave and Donetta actually were with us. They met us there. And, uh, we went in to eat. So there's me and my wife, Debbie. There's Dave and Donetta. And we've got, 
we've got Quincy and Marlo. And so they sit, at, sit us down at this big round table. So we sit down at the big round table. As soon as you walk in Cracker Barrel, you guys know what I'm talking about? It's right there on the right, right? They sit us right there. And we're all sitting there. Now, they threw our menus down on the table. The, guy, the host that took us in there. Put them on the table. We're sitting down. Next thing I know, there is a server. His name is Mark. He's worked there for 15 years. If you've gone to Cracker Barrel, you may know who Mark is. But he turned this ordinary event into an extraordinary event, especially for me and Debbie. Here's what he did. He walks up to our table, and the first thing he does, he says, hello, and he sits down. He said, I know the grandkids need something real quick. And he sets Quincy and Marlo down a hot fresh, warm biscuit. First thing, he comes to our table, sets them down with a biscuit. Then right behind that, he follows it up with butter and jelly. And then he asked the question, oh, you may not like the butter in that little pack. Would you like soft butter? And we said, yeah. He brought soft butter to the table in a dish and we just put it on that biscuit. And he said, here's jelly for the grandkids. Let's get them started with something to eat first. And so they had hot biscuits and we cut them in half. And we put the butter on there and it's melting and we put some jelly on top of it. And then he says, I'm sure they're going to get meals, right? He said, yeah, we're going to order them something. He said, well, good. That means they're going to get milk. What kind of milk you want? We said, well, we want white milk for them. And so he brought them a carton of white milk. He brought him a plastic cup to pour it in. He brought a lid to put on top of it. He brought them their own special straws that had cocoa inside the straw. And they stick the straw down in the white milk. They suck it out. It turns into chocolate milk. Greatest thing ever. So now we have our grandkids that are sitting there consuming this biscuit that's hot with this melting butter and jelly with this white milk that's turned into chocolate milk. Their parents told us not to give them chocolate milk. We did not give them chocolate milk. We gave them white milk with a cocoa straw, <laughs> right? So they're sucking it up and it turns into, into chocolate milk. And then they take our order and we give Mark our order and he brings us what we want to drink. And I drank water. Debbie drank sweet tea. I think Donetta, I can't remember. I think she got water. And Dave, it's Diet Coke anywhere Dave goes. And so he brings out our drinks. He puts them on the table. Not only do I get one glass of water, he brings me two. Not only one glass of tea, there's two. Not only so forth around the table. We did not have to ever ask for refills. I mean, the whole thing was extraordinary, right? Now I could go on and on and on with the service that we got from Mark that day. So my question to you, what event that you may be part of turns that event from just an ordinary event to an extraordinary event that takes place in your life? Well, obviously the last couple of years for all of us, in the world, in America, has been difficult, right? Difficult events for us to get through. Possibly for some this past year, maybe for some has been one of the worst years ever, which is why I want to try my best to end this year at Victory Church on a high note. In the midst of periods of times that can be dark and difficult, I want you to know there is a light at the end of the tunnel. As difficult as life can be in the year 2022 with all that we have come through and with all the uncertainty that's going on in our culture and in our world in America today, I want you to know on the authority of God's word that we have hope. The ordinary events that you go through can turn into extraordinary events whenever you look at things with a biblical world view and you are reminded that God is still on the throne, that God is still in control, that God still has authority over all things, that God is still sovereign. What I'm trying to say, regardless what you may be going through, the ordinary events of life that can be dark and depressing to look at, I want you to know they all can be turned into extraordinary events when you trust Jesus as your Savior and you look at those events with a biblical perspective and have a biblical worldview on things and know that God is sovereign. He is in control. All of those events can be turned into extraordinary events. Somebody needs to say amen right there. 
or I'm going to have to preach and come down there and sit and say amen and come back up here and preach. But it worked out so much better for all of us if you help me out a little bit. Amen? amen? Woo, there's hope in the person of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, as I was preparing this message, I was reminded about a pastor friend of mine back in Bryson City, North Carolina. His name is Brother Eddie is what we called him. He was Pastor Eddie Dietz. And he's in the Bryson City area. He pastored a church up in Silva, not too far from Bryson City. And he and I officiated a lot of funeral services together. Brother Eddie always brought out this particular verse. Every single funeral service he ever preached, he drawed the attention to Psalm 30 and verse number 5, the latter part of that verse. It says this, weeping may last through the night. Everybody say, but joy. <laughs> Weeping may last through the night. Say, but joy. Talk to me, church. Say, but joy. Weeping may last through the night, but honey, I promise you, there is joy that comes in the morning. Amen? And that joy is that hope that we have in the person of Jesus Christ. I don't know if you can tell I'm a little bit excited this morning. I mean, to start off a service with baptism, that excites me. To start off a service also, this morning we had our V group where we got into the Bible, into the Word of God, and, and we're out there unpacking Galatians chapter 1, and, and I'm thinking how wonderful it is when God's people get together and just open up the Bible. Let me encourage you, if you're not plugged into a Bible study anywhere, get here at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. We have our V group that started. We're opening up the Word of God and just studying one chapter together. Come and be part of that. We'd love for you to be part of that. But my day started off with that, then a baptism, and then this sermon that series that I've been working on over the past several weeks. Listen, weeping may endure for that. Hardships may be there for a season in your life. But honey, I got hope. And my hope is not in our government. My hope is not in politics. Say amen. My hope is not in a sports team. Listen, I'm a Tennessee Titan fan, and, and we did our Christmas family with our kids, and, and that was our gift that, that we gave our kids. My son-in-law is a Chiefs fan. How many Chiefs fans we got in here? He's not here today. Are there any? No? And so, you know, I'm from the southeast, so I, I, I kind of had to pick a team in, in the southeast, and I, I tried to pull for my Carolina Panthers, but man, that was just, that's been so hard. And I'm like, well, let's get halfway between home and here. And so let's go to Tennessee. And uh, so we've been pulling for the Titans. Tyler and I have. And, and uh, Tyler longer than myself. And I kind of jumped on that bandwagon here in the last week or, or year or two because I just needed an NFL team to pull for. And, and so, I, you know, I love Derrick Henry. And I kind of love the, the coach and, and their whole. So anyway, we, we, we took our family Christmas and gave them a Christmas gift and went to Kansas City for the Chiefs versus the Tennessee Titans football game on Sunday night, which was about two or three weeks ago, whenever it was. You, you may have seen it on TV. Great game until the end. Listen, Mahomes, you just don't ever give him the ball with any time on the clock. Right? I mean, we just couldn't stop him. Just could not. He is an amazing athlete. He, he, you guys watch football? Does anybody have any idea what I'm talking about right here? All right? Okay, amazing. So anyway, we got beat. Here's I said all that to say this. You can't put your hope in a sports team. They will let you down. Now, they may do their best, but they're going to let you down. There is someone you can put your hope in. And that, per, that someone is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He will never let you down. Scripture says that he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Scripture says that Jesus said all of, all of God's promises are yea. It means yes in Christ Jesus. I mean, he is always there. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And a lot of times we get discouraged and depressed and we lose hope because we get our focus off of the Lord Jesus Christ. But weeping may endure for a season. That's what it says in the James, but joy comes in the morning. So I'm still in my introduction. I've got to get to my message. Sorry. Here's what I want to try to share with you. This Chris, Christmas season, let's begin an extraordinary journey. And this journey is going to be unpacking hope, unpacking peace, unpacking joy, unpacking love. And I'm going to try to do that during this Christmas season. So let me get to point number one as we talk about hope. This can be the best Christmas ever when you realize something. I want you to understand, this can be the best Christmas ever. Everybody say best Christmas ever. <laughs> Every time you say that, I want you to think about my mother. This is the best I ever had. <laughs> this can be the best Christmas ever 
but only when you realize a few things. Number one is this. You got to realize that our hope is in Christ. Amen. Nothing else. Our hope. Listen, you can't put your hope in me. I will let you down. As much as I'm going to try my best to serve you and please you and do the best I can to minister to you and best I can to lead this church, I am a man. I am a fallen man, just like each and every one of us. You put your eyes on me. You put me on a pedestal. Honey, I'm going to let you down, right? But I promise you there's someone who will not. And we got to put our hope in Jesus Christ. We can't put our hope in politics. Can't put our hope in a sports team. You can't even put your hope in this church as much as we love you, as much as we want to serve together, as much as we want to do everything we can to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God. You can't just put your hope in a system or in a religious group or even in a church. You got to have your hope in the person of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that Jesus' arrival on earth, and I put the major scene there intentionally because I want you to focus on that. When you think about the arrival of Jesus on earth, he brought the greatest source of hope that people had ever experienced or ever had. When you think about the culture of that day, when you think about all that was going on, when you go back in the Old Testament, you read the prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you see them come into fruition here, what amazing hope he brought. For centuries, God's people had just stumbled in the darkness. For centuries, they've been in hope of the Savior that, were, that would come. For centuries, God's people had been tormented. For centuries, God's people had been defeated. For, God, for centuries, God's people and all the promises that God gave them never really came to fruition until that night when that baby, when that child was born that we celebrate at Christmas. He brought hope to people that were in darkness, and he still brings hope to all of us today. Many of us know, many of us know what it feels like to be surrounded by darkness, right? We know what it feels to be surrounded by darkness. And as we struggle with disappointments and mistakes and failures and sin, it's hard to have hope when all we see is darkness. Would you agree? You know what needs to happen? For you to make this the best Christmas ever, there needs to be a paradigm shift. Everybody say that with me. Paradigm. Everybody say paradigm. Paradigm. There needs to be what? A paradigm shift in your life. In other words, you need to quit looking at the world and the structure of the world, the cosmos, the world system. You need to quit looking at that through the lens of news media and the culture and the government and politics and everything. By the way, <laughs> you know what politics are, right? Well, it's a combination of, this is tongue-in-cheek, it's a combination of two Greek words. Poly, meaning many. Ticks, blood-sucking creatures. Politics are many blood-sucking creatures, right? Just kidding. Just seeing if you're staying awake out there, right? I can't put my hope in that. That is always changing, right? And it always will be. Matter of fact, my son and I, we, we've kind of gotten into these history YouTube channels, and he sent me some, and I just love watching them, and he's been engrossed in those, and he's going back, and he's telling me histories of, of all these different elections and how framed they've all, some of them have been, and not just currently. I'm talking about back years ago, way back in the birth of, of America. It's, all kind, it's always been like that. They ain't never going to change. Hello? I don't care who's sitting in Washington. No, that's ever going to change, right? So I don't put my hope in that. I kind of look over there and see what's going on. Say, that's a mess. Always has been. Always will be. My hope is in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Right? I don't know how I got off on that. It's hard to, hard to have hope, yeah, when all we see is darkness all around us. So in order to be able to eliminate the darkness, we must expose the darkness to light, and that light is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Here's something I want you to see. When Jesus was born, the ancient prophecies were fulfilled, and the world found this hope. They found hope in the birth of the Savior. He is the light of the world, and the darkness cannot overcome any of us. Verse of Scripture I want you to look at right here. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Everybody say, Isaiah. Isaiah. 
9 and 2. I want you to look at this verse of Scripture. Mark it in your Bibles. By the way, you can get my sermon notes at johnlcountain.com. You'll have all this there. But here I want you to look at this particular passage of Scripture. Now, this is unique for a reason, Isaiah's, or Isaiah's writings. He was an Old Testament prophet. The time that Isaiah was writing these prophecies, and I'm going to give you a timeline here in just a, mo a moment, was some 700 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's people were in a very dark season in their life. Isaiah stands up and proclaims this from the Lord. And he says this in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 2. He says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. What are they doing? They're walking in darkness. Some 700, this is around 700 BC, somewhere around that time frame. Okay, 700 years before the birth of Christ. What he is prophesying, what he is saying is that the people who walk in darkness, they will see, not they may see, they might see, they will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Now, real quickly, I don't have time to get bogged down here, but I'm trying to set the stage so you understand exactly what's taking place here. This is what's called the Iron Age II era, okay? And I put some time frames on the, you may want to take a picture of this and study it out some, but this is from about 1000 to 529 BC. Here's what's taking place in the life of God's people, Israel. Around 1000 BC, King David conquers Jerusalem, okay? That's around 1000 BC. He conquers Jer Jerusalem. He declares the city capital of the Jewish kingdom as Jerusalem, okay? Around 960 BC, his son, King Solomon, he builds the first Jewish temple. Remember, David wanted to build the temple, but God wouldn't let David build the temple because he was a man of war, right? So he let his son build the temple. That was around 960 BC. We're leading up to the birth of Christ that we celebrate, which brings great what? Great hope. Everybody say it with me. It brings great what? It brings great These people in a very dark period of time, right? So Solomon builds the temple. 721 BC, Assyrians conquer Samaria. Refugees flee into Jerusalem. The city then expands into the western hill. 720 or 701 BC, Assyrians ruler Sennacherib, which we read about in the Old Testament, Sennacherib lays siege to Jerusalem. Now, Sennacherib was the powerful Assyrian emperor who waged war against Judah at the end of the 8th century, which is God's people, right? So he comes and he destroys them and takes over them. And then God's people are carried away into Babylonian captivity, or they're in, in 560, 560 Babylonian, Babylonian forces destroy Jerusalem and they demolish the first temple. So I said all that to say this, and I don't have time to unpack any of that. That's a little brief look at some of the history of God's people and the dark times that they were in. Sometimes when we look at Scripture, we think, oh, if we could just live when, when... It was hard for them, too. Just like it's hard for us today. They lived in a dark season. Just like we live in a dark world today, right? But Isaiah prophesied to them in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. He said, yes, you people are walking in darkness, but you will see light. He says, for those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Now, Isaiah was a prophet of God. Some would say he's the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. I differ with that because Jesus told us who the greatest prophet in the Old, Old Testament was. Does anybody know who that was? He's mentioned in the New Testament. John the Baptist. You guys realize that, that John the Baptist was an Old Testament prophet that was revealed to us in the New Testament. And Jesus even said, been none greater than John, right? So I would disagree with that statement that some say that Isaiah is the greatest because Jesus said that John the Baptist is the greatest. But I think we all could agree we all could agree that he was prophesying to a broken people. Was he not? Stay with me, church. Was he prophesying to a broken people? The answer to that is yes. They were filled with despair. They were living in some of the darkest times in Israel's history. Yet, Isaiah offered hope. What Isaiah offered to the people 
In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, when he says, I know you're walking in a dark season, but light is coming, what he offered to them was hope when he prophesied that the Christ child, that the Lord Jesus Christ would come. Now, we all know that Christ already came, right? He came born of the Virgin Mary. But all of the prophecies, I don't have time to preach all of this either, but all the prophecy that Isaiah prophesied hasn't been fulfilled. Part of it has, but all of it hasn't. But we're living in dark times today as well. In our culture, in our world, it seems like it's turned so pagan and so against God. It seems like sin is celebrated and righteousness is mocked and made fun of. Why is all that? It's the dark season that we live in. But there's still hope. Why is that? Because we know that Christ Jesus has already come once. And we are patiently waiting for him to return again. I preached a whole series of messages on the end times. And what the Bible teaches us, how it will all unfold. It's all on my YouTube channel. You can go there and watch every one of those messages. But the next prophetic event to take place for God's people is the rapture of the church. I don't know about you. I know we live in dark days. I know we live in dark times. I'm one, I can't even stand to watch the news anymore. I'm just so done with all that because nobody reports the news. All they report is their narrative. All they're saying is what they want you to hear. I just, I'm just done with that. I'm just looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to live the best life I can live for him. I want to serve him. I want to be faithful to preach his word. Whether anybody wants to hear it or not, I want to be faithful to the Lord because my hope is in him and I am anxiously looking for the return of Jesus Christ when he comes in the air and he raptures the church out of here and we go to be with the Lord. Then the world's still going to be here through the tribulation period. Then we're going to come back with him and he's actually going to sit on David's throne and he's going to rule and reign the world for a thousand years and we're going to come with him and rule and reign this world for a thousand years. And you may be thinking, well, I guess all this is going to be destroyed here real soon. Well, if Jesus were to come right now and rapture the church, as far as what prophecy tells us and end time prophecy tells us, this world will exist at least another thousand and seven years, maybe a little bit longer. There's a millennial reign of Christ a thousand years on this earth, seven year tribulation. Here on this earth, but I am looking forward to the return of Jesus. That's where my hope is, and I hope that's where your hope is also, okay? So as we journey together here through this Christmas season, we must acknowledge and recognize the hope that we share in Christ our Savior. Number two, I got to hit these last two pretty quick, okay? Number two is simply this. This can be the best Christmas ever. Everybody say, best Christmas ever. Who are you thinking about when you say that? Yeah, my mother-in-law, right? This can be the best Christmas ever. If one, our hope is in Christ, but two, our hope sees light in the midst of darkness. Well, what do I mean by that? Whenever I say our hope sees light in the midst of darkness, what do I mean by that? I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 15. Look at this passage of Scripture. Now, this is the Apostle Paul, and he's quoting from Isaiah, partially from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. He's using a part of his, his prophecy, and he quotes it here in his writings to the Christians at Rome. And he says in verse 12, And in another place Isaiah said, Their heir to David's throne will come, and he will rule over the Gentiles. And they will place their what? They will place their hope on him. Then he says in verse 13, he says, I pray that God, the source of hope. Everybody say source of hope. Who is the source of hope? God. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's what I want you to see. Our joy increases. Our peace increases as we put more and more trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we are trusting him, we're being overwhelmed and overflowing with this confident hope that is taking place in our life. A couple things I want you to get out of this, and I'll try to briefly get through this as quick as I can. Here's a big point I want you to get. You need to screenshot this because the devil will come tell you there's no hope. No, there is hope. But here's what I want you to see. Hope doesn't increase because of favorable circumstances in your life. I mean, all the circumstances could start working well in your life, and you think, man, all the, all the stars 
things are coming into alignment in my life. Oh, now, there is hope now because everything is favorable. Everything seems to be working out. Let me tell you something. Hope doesn't increase simply because your circumstances are getting better. Are you with me? Nor does it decrease because of unfavorable circumstances. You know, your life may be going the wrong way. And the circumstances are horrible. And you're finding yourself in an unfavorable position, whatever it may be. Let me tell you something, honey. You still have hope. Your hope doesn't increase or decrease based off your circumstances. Everybody get it? I say get it. You say got it. Good, right? So your hope doesn't increase or decrease because of circumstances in your life. No. Our hope is not based on our circumstance. What did I just tell you? Let me back up here. In verse number 13, you need to write this down. Romans 15, verse 13. The source of our hope are our circumstances? Talk to me. No. What does it say in verse 13? I pray that God, comma, the source of your hope. So who is the source of our hope? It's God himself. It's not our circumstances. A lot of times people think, boy, man, things are lining up well for me. I I now have hope. No, honey, you have always had hope. You're just not looking at it. Your hope is not in your circumstances. Point one of my message. Your hope is in whom? Your hope is in God. Your hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, not in your circumstances getting good or better. So here's my main point I want you to get here. Hope resides in the person of Christ Hope resides in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, even in the deepest, darkest pain and loss in your life. I want you to know you can still have overflowing hope in your life. The difficulty in life is this, to maintain a trust and confidence in God's plan for our life. That's the difficulty. The difficulty is to maintain confidence and trust in what God's plan for our lives may be. It's natural to doubt, is it not? As we start living out our life and we're going the direction we feel like God's calling us to go and we meet some hardships in life or we meet some unfavorable circumstances in life, oftentimes we'll start doubting, oh, this may not be God's will for me. No, maybe it is God's will for you. Maybe it is God's will for you to go through that trial so he can teach you something. You see, the Christian life is not about just living on the mountaintop all the time and having just wonderful experiences all the time. Sometimes to get to the next mountaintop, you've got to walk through a valley. Now, if you've lived out here in these flatlands all the time, you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. But if you're raised where I was raised and you're on one mountaintop and you see the other one you want to get to, you've got to come off of that mountaintop. You've got to go all the way down to the bottom and there's going to be a creek down there, maybe a few of them, and cross those creeks and start climbing up to the other side. And then you can get to the next mountaintop. The same thing is true in our life. If we're going to have one mountaintop experience, in order to get to the place where we have another mountaintop experience, it's going to require us to go through some valleys of life to get there so we can rejoice again. So it may be that God is leading you through the valley of the shadow of death or whatever it may be in order to get you to the next place. So we can still have this amazing hope in the person of Jesus Christ. So here's what I want you to get. On your absolute worst day. Everybody say worst day. day. On your absolute worst day. Everything's going horrible. You've gotten horrible news from the doctor. I mean, life is at, it seems like it's over at this point. I want you to know, on your absolute worst day, Christ is for you. Now let that sink in. A lot of times we want to go sit under a juniper tree. And we want to get on social media. And we just want to be the victim. And we want to get all the old oh, hugs, kisses on. Sorry. Uh, uh, uh-uh. Even on my worst day, I don't have to do that. Why? Christ is for me. 
Amen? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I am not going to pull an Elijah and go over there and sit under a juniper tree and think that I'm the only one that's left and God had to come by and show me, hey, I've got a lot of people out there still worshiping me. Amen? i got a lot of people out there still living for me. I don't want to be that one that just is negative Nancy and sits on the sideline and moans and cries and plays the victim in their life all the time. Listen, you're going to get hurt in life. That's just, there's a four-letter word for that. It's not the one you're thinking, but there's a four-letter word for that. It's called life, L-I-F-E. You're going to get hurt. Bank it. Bank on it. I mean, people are going to hurt you intentionally, and people are going to hurt you unintentionally. That's going to happen. But even on your worst day, in the middle of all of that, I've got hope for you. What is that hope? Christ is for you. <laughs> Amen? Christ is for you. Now, here's what I want you to get. The latter part of that slide says this. His light is shining on and through the darkness in your life. So my question to you is simply this. Will you let Christ live in you? Will you let Christ shine through you? When you're going through those difficult seasons in life and all of your circumstances seem to be completely unfavorable and it seems like the world and maybe even your best friend has turned on you, don't get over there and become the negative Nancy or Nicholas. <laughs> so I don't want ladies saying I'm just picking on ladies. No, whoever you are. Just don't be that negative person laying over there playing the victim. Rise up and say, you know what? In the midst of this hurt that I'm going through, in the midst of these horrible circumstances that I'm involved in right now, I can't change them. But what I can do, I can change my attitude. I can change my outlook. I don't have power on what everybody else is going to do, but I do have power on what I'm going to do today. Hello? Are you with me? I don't have the power to change the circumstances, but I got power to change my attitude. Say amen or on me, but let me know you're listening. Right? I can rise up and I can say, hey, if God is for me, who can be against me? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. He's promised me he'd never leave me, nor he would never forsake me. He's promised me that all of God's promises are yes in his son, Christ Jesus. He promised me that he would meet all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I am not in this thing alone. I will not sit over here and let the circumstances dictate what type of a day I'm going to have. I'm going to rise up because greater is he that's in me. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. I have hope today, and I am going to let my light shine, and everybody else that knows what kind of a miserable day I am having, they are going to see how a child of God responds. Amen. Amen. Our hope is not in our circumstances. Our hope is not in politics. Our hope is not in our best friend that's out there. Our hope is in who, church? Our hope is in Jesus. <laughs> Man, that's good enough preaching. I'll make an Episcopalian shout a little bit. Amen. <laughs> right? Our hope is in the Lord. That's what I want you to see. So I want you to rise up. I want you to live out that hope that you have. I want you to let other people see Jesus in your life. I got I to gotta stop. I got to get to point number three right here. Man, that's good stuff. This can be the best Christmas ever. Say best Christmas ever. That's the best I ever had, right? This, the whole title of this thing is built off my mother-in-law. This can be the best Christmas ever if you would just realize, one, our hope is in Christ. Two, our hope sees light in the midst of the darkness that we may be in. And number three, our purpose is being filled with hope. Our purpose of being filled with hope. I want to go back to Romans 15 and verse number 13. This is my last point, so I want to try to expound on it briefly and bring this thing to a close, okay? So give me, and I know I've been a little bit long today. Oh, I've been very long today. I'm sorry, but I hope, I hope you're okay, all right? I want you to get this. I want to go back to Romans 15, verse 13. Key verse of scripture in this message today. I want to lean into it. I want to unpack it briefly. Let's look at it together. I pray that God, the source of hope, who's the source of our hope? Now, I'm telling you that right now. And you may say, why does he keep telling me that? Because you're going to walk out that door and the world's going to hit you square in the face. Right? And you may find yourself in some unfavorable circumstances. And you may think, man, I just went to church today. Now, my life is hopeless. You've completely forgot what I told you. Your life is never hopeless. On your worst day ever, remember what I said? Christ is what? For you. With you. Exactly. He's with you. He's for you. Our hope is in him. 
right? He's always there. God is the source. Not anything else in this world. God is the source. He's the source of everything in your life. He's the source of your hope, according to this, this, this verse. And it also says that he will fill you. Everybody say fill you. He will fill you completely with joy and peace. So you may think in these horrible circumstances that I find myself in, how in the world am I going to rise up and be the light of Christ for a world that sees me here? You want me to tell you why? Because your hope is not in your circumstances. Your hope is in God, the source of your hope. And when you realize that and you put your faith in that and you trust that, Romans 15, 13 says then that I will fill you, not partially, not I will give you a little bit of this. He says, I will fill you with what? Joy and peace. You want this to be the best Christmas ever? You want to have joy and peace this Christmas like you've never had at all? I realize the last two or three years we have lived through, I get, who, who in the world could have ever seen any of this coming over the last two or three years? Total shock with, by me and the whole world and you, I know, to live through what we've lived through. But I want you to know in the midst of that, we can still be filled with joy. We can still be filled with peace. How? Because we know God and we know his son Jesus and we've trusted him in him as our savior and we know that our hope is in God. He is the source of our hope. He completely fills us with joy and peace. Why? Because we trust in him. Is that not what the text says? Because we trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope. Now, here's what I'm talking about here on this last part. Our purpose of being filled with hope is that we have joy and peace in life, and the last part of this verse, you overflow with this confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, do I have time to tell you a story? Are you guys, you guys need to go? If you, let me say this. If you need to leave, I understand. Okay, if you've got appointments or whatever, but I want to finish this message. If I had plenty of more Sundays to preach, I'd just turn this into a six or eight week. I got to be done by Christmas, okay? So I got to finish this. So let me finish it. If you need to leave, I understand. That's fine. You go ahead. But for those that want to stay here and listen, you should stay with me, okay? He says, I want to fill you with joy and peace. Why? Because we trust in him. Then you will overflow with this confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, our hope is in who? God. He's the source of our hope. In whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, he's going to fill us with joy and peace as long as we're looking to him for our hope. And then as a result of that, we're trusting in him. We're now going to overflow with this confident hope. There was a season in my life here at Victory Church as pastor, leading our work here, leading our ministry here, that I was struggling. I was struggling with hope of what the future of this church was looking like. I was struggling, kind of thinking, maybe it's time for me to leave. All those things are just running through my mind periodically. Well, this was back around 2006, 2007 time frame. At that particular time, we had, we had been told no three different times from the city of Mascuda. We took three different building projects to them to try to build our church on the property that we had. I still remember the name of the street and the address, 973 North 6th Street, Muscoota, Illinois. If you drive by there today, it's right beside Chevy Park. There's a little services in there called Trinity Services that are there today. That was our church. We built on that back part. We had three acres of land there. I had a developer that has been a good friend to Victory Church over the years by the name of Tim Capert. You may know him. He's building all this right across the street. His family now is involved in that, Capert Construction. None of that in Hunters Creek and Muscoota was developed except for one little portion of it that Tim now was taking over and going to develop the rest of the land. Tim comes to my office. He lays out a plot of all that land from Fuser Road all the way down to Chevy Park. And he says, Pastor, I own all this. And he said, how much land do you need? I said, well, I'd, I'd love to have three to, five, I mean, three to six acres. We have three acres now. I'd love to have six to build our church home. 
He said, well, that's no problem. I'll give it to you. Just tell me what part of it you want. I'll give you three acres adjoining the current three acres you're on or all that out there, whatever you want, I'll give you six acres. Oh, wow. Right? So I looked at the corner lot. We're now, if you drive by there today, at the corner of Fuser Road and 6th Street, the south part of, of uh, Fuser and 6th Street right there at that intersection. It's called the Chief's Lane. Right? If you've driven by there, they've got big houses right there now that are built. I was going to look at that for six acres right there to move our church from where we were down there and build something. And then I thought, well, no, I'll just, I'll just take this three acres beside the three acres we have and just add on to this structure and, and stay right here. He said, whatever you want, it's fine with me, it's yours. Thought, wow, thank you. So then I draw up some plans and I try to take things to the city of Mascuda to build. Three different times was voted down in a city council meeting, no. We will not let you build on that property. And I said, what about this? Up? We will not let you build on any of that property. Well, long story short, you know, <laughs> part of the problem is as a nonprofit organization, there's no tax revenue coming in on that, right? You understand that? There's a little bit of stuff going on there. So some of that was going on. Um, finally, I said, well, guys, you're leaving me no source, but I'm going to have to sell everything and move. And they said, whatever you got to do, we're not going to let you build. Our church was growing. At that particular time, we were meeting down at the Muscuda Middle School gym on Sunday mornings. We'd even move over to the high school gym when that gym was closed and have services there. And um, so we're, we were struggling. So they said, no. I'm thinking, well, this is it. I, as far as I can bring them, it must be time for me to leave. I was losing hope. And then there was a, there was a friend of mine, a mutual friend of our ministry here and uh, a big developer here in the community that, that came to me and he said, uh, we had lunch at St. Louis Bread Co. back when it was called that back in the day. And uh, he said, uh, Pastor, I want to share with you a piece of property that may be available. He said, now, it's going to take some work. He said, but he may sell it to you. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, out on Scott Troy Road, talking about this piece of property, he said, there's a piece of property there, but it's owned by Jack Schmidt, and Jack Schmidt Chevrolet. And he said, I don't know if he'll sell it to you or not, but you may want to talk to him. Man, my hope now is maybe this is where God is leading. Now, looking back now, it's God's hand working, kind of moving us to this spot. But at that particular moment, I was starting to lose hope. I went back to this verse, even back then, and started resonating in my spirit. I've got hope. I've got hope. I've got hope in Christ. He's going to fill me with this confident hope. I was praying, God, fill me with this confident hope. I'm trusting you. I'm trying to do my best to plant and build and grow this church. And we're without a home and we're setting up and tearing down in a school gym. And God, we need, I need something. I need something to break through here. And that's kind of my prayer and where my mindset was in the time. So I think, okay, Monday morning, I get up. We'd had our services at the uh, school gym. I get up Monday morning. I drive straight to Jack Schmidt Chevrolet. I walk in there, and of course, soon as back in the day, you walk in there and sell them, and we're coming everywhere. Oh, what are we going to show you? Da, 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 da. I don't need a car. Well, what do you need? I need to see Jack. Well, you got to go talk to his receptionist over here. So I went to the receptionist, and um, he said, she said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm, I need to have a meeting with Jack Schmidt. And she said, does he know you're coming? And I said, no. And she said, so you don't have an appointment with him? I said, no, he doesn't even know me, but I need to meet with him today. Now, what is that? That's confident hope that was rising up in me that something was going to break through here for Victory Church. And she said, he doesn't take appointments like that with just anybody that walks off the street. And I said, ma'am, I am not just anybody. I am the pastor of Victory Church, and I'm looking to buy that property that he has at 223 Scott Troy Road. I think he's got a lot of land out there, and I want to buy it. Now, at that time, I didn't have a dime in my pocket to buy that land. <laughs> I had no idea how we were going to buy this land at that time. So she says, well, I'll tell him. I said, just tell him what I just told you. So she did. She calls up there and she said, uh, Pastor John Cannon, Victory Church in Mascuda is looking to buy your land on Scott Troy Road. Wants to meet with you today about that. Have you talked to him? He says, tell him, stay right there. I'll be right out. Now at that time, before they've remodeled everything there now, there was a balcony where Jack's office was and it was up in the top and it was all glass up there. I saw the door open and he comes out of his door and he stands on the railing at the balcony and he says, 
here I go. Now, I'd never met him before in my life. I'm way outside my element. I'm just a country boy from Western North Carolina, okay? And here I am now just standing in confident hope, saying that we're going to buy this land. I have no idea how any of that's going to come to pass, but I'm thinking, here, I'm taking the next step. It's all I know to do, take the next step. So I meet with him in his office, and he says, how much land are you looking to buy? I said, really all I need is about five acres. If I can get five acres on the front there by the road, that's what I would like to have. He said, no, I will not divide it. He said, I've got 20, whatever it is, 21 acres, whatever it is we have here. He said, I'll sell it all or I'll sell none. And I said, well, I'm sorry, sir. I can't afford all of it. He said, if you, and this is what he said, and you've heard me say that. He said, if you can afford five acres, you can afford 21 acres. And I'm thinking, well, he's doing some type of math that I don't know, right? That, that's not my type of adding things up. But I said, okay. He says, Here what, here's what I want you to do. I want us to start meeting on Wednesdays for lunch, and we'll go out to lunch, and I'll pick the place, and I'll buy lunch. I want us to go talk about this and this and that. And that. So for the next several weeks, I'm doing lunch on Wednesday with Jack Schmidt, right? And we're just going to lunch, and we're eating in different places, and he's picking up the tab, and he's buying everything, and we're talking, and he's wanting to hear about my history and my story, and he's unpacking his history and his story and, and everything about this land and how he got it, how he, how he was going to develop it. He was going to put his dealership here and he decided to move it up to where it currently is now. And, and he got this in a deal with some, uh, and there's a whole list of things of how he got it, right? I said, okay, what's the price for all of it? And he gave me a price. And at the time it was cheaper than what I could have bought one acre up here on the corner for, for what we got 21 acres here. That's what kind of deal he gave us. It was still expensive, but not as expensive as it could have been. And he said this, he said, you know, he said, pastor, I would love to see a church on that property. That's what he told me. So he gave us the amount. I can't even remember what the amount is. I have to go back in the books and pull that number out. He gave, gave me this amount. And I said, okay, let me go to work, see what I could do. So the first thing I did, I went back to our leadership team. We came over here. We walked this whole property, our leadership team and their wives, and we're walking around it. You got to remember, this wasn't cleared. It was thick woods all the way up to the road. Okay, none of this, all this has been cleared out. It was thick woods. All, we couldn't even walk in there. There was a big ravine right here where water was rushing through. We had to fill in. A lot of work had to be done on this property. We really couldn't walk in. We just walked the parameters around it. And I thought, well, I think we can do something with this. And so I said, let me see if I can get some financing. So I went back to our denomination and our missions department, and they have what's called a church extension loan fund that they give missionaries and church planners within our denomination. So I went down there and met with them, told them what I was trying to do, applied for a loan through them, got the loan, but we had to come up with the nut. And I can't even remember what the, the deposit was that we had to come up with. So I come back to the church, and I'm trying to do these money drives and this kingdom builder drive and, and this sacrificial giving drive with our congregation to give and give and give. And they were giving and giving and giving. And finally, they had given, you know, I'd pulled every dollar I knew to pull out of any pocket, right? I mean, we were, this is all we were going to get. We're supposed to close the next week. My hope is going down just a little bit. And I called Jack that Monday morning after that Sunday service. And I said, Jack, I said, first of all, thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for me. Thank you for every meeting we've had. Thank you for every lunch that you've bought. Thank you for every deal that you've worked. But I'm going to have to pull out of the deal. He said, why? I said, we don't have the deposit that we need in order to get the loan for the property. And he said, I said, I'm short. And he said, well, how much short are you? And I said, we're $30,000 short of where I need to be. He said, well, John, that's no problem. I'll just write you a check. I'll write you a check for 30000 and let's go to closing next week. I said, really? He said, yeah. He, who would I make it out to? Immediately I thought, I didn't say this, but I thought, man, why didn't I tell him $100,000 short or, <laughs> you know, whatever. I mean, I didn't say that, but I did think. And I think, get thee behind me, Satan, right? And let's, let's not look a gift horse in the mouth here. And, and so he wrote us a check for $30,000. And here I'm going to closing in the closer, we're going to write a check to Jack Schmidt, and I got a check from him for 30000 that we put in our deposit so that we can make. I mean, it's just amazing how God works. It kind of goes back to this verse. There was an overflow of confident hope that was rising in me as I was going through that whole thing. And you know what? Ever since then, ever since I was told no in Mascuda, it's like, okay, God has another plan another purpose, another direction that he wants us to go. And I believe that the steps, and the Bible says in Psalms and Proverbs that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, but also the stops of a good man 
are ordered by the Lord. Sometimes God closes a door in order to open a door. And I think that's what he did here for us and brought us here to this amazing location that we have now. But I want you to know, I said all that to say this, that you will overflow. When you realize that God is the source of your hope, then you will overflow with this amazing, confident hope that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me try to wrap this thing up. I'm going to try to get to a conclusion as quick as I can. Do you know the purpose of a lighthouse, right? Everybody understands what a lighthouse is that sits on the bay and what have you. The purpose of a lighthouse is twofold. One, to be a navigational aid to those that need it, to help mark where they are so they can use it to navigate. Two, to warn boats of danger that's there in that area. So as we are filled with hope, here's what I want you to know, that we also are like a lighthouse. Our hope is a lot like the light in a lighthouse. It guides us through life as we are following living out God's plan in our, and purpose in our life. And we also share it with others. The dangers will be the, if you miss heaven, that's a dangerous thing, right? So what we are to be doing is to be the lighthouse in the world that we're living in. And that only comes through the hope that we have in the person of Jesus Christ. Why? Because God is the source of our hope. When we trust in him, he will fill us with joy and peace. When we trust in him, he will fill us with this overflowing, confident hope that we are to be the light in the difficult circumstances that we find ourselves in. We are to use the hope to guide us in life in the way that God wants us to go and live out our purpose in life, but also that we share it with others, that we share the gospel with others. Now, 1 Peter 3.15 says, be ready to give and when people ask you about the hope that you have as a believer, be ready to explain it. I'm trying to hurry through some of this. Matthew 5, 14, Jesus talks about being a light that's on a hill and how we, um, we're, we're to give light to everyone in the house. Verse 16, in the same way, let your good deeds that's, that's being carried out because of the hope that we have shine out for all to see. So we are to live out and be a lighthouse. So here's what I want you to get as I try to wrap this thing up. I want my wife to come up here, so I'll stop, okay? She's going to help me with some announcements. We'll be done. You are a lighthouse to a broken and a lost world, right? We all are. We are a lighthouse to a broken and a lost world. Here's what I want. Don't hide your light. Rise up in the hope that you have. Rise up in that confident hope and let your light shine. Why? Because Christ is the center of our life. He is the hope that we have. So allow the hope of Christ to light in you. So let me give a couple more things right here. The best Christmas ever, it's going to be rooted in your hope. There's no greater gift that you can give around, the, around us than give the gift of eternal hope of Christ. Listen, there will be people that you run across this Christmas that do not have any hope whatsoever. Why don't you share that hope with them? Just like a lighthouse does right? Help navigate their life. Help warn them of the dangers. Share with them the gospel of Jesus, what Jesus has done for you. Give them some hope in the midst of what they're living through and what they're going to. So I want you to do this. I want you to choose hope this Christmas season, and I want you to let it be contagious. There's a quote by C.S. Lewis. I mean, I'm trying to wrap it up. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking. But it's one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians, get this, who did the most for the present world were just those who fought the most of the next. They had hope of what was next in life. It's easy to get overwhelmed by the state of our world today and lose heart and lose hope. But I want you to know that Jesus has overcome the world. Now, here's the takeaway. Here's what I want you to do. This is the so what slide right here, okay? I said all that for you to ask the question, so what? What does that mean to me? Here's what it means. Number one, choose hope. Everybody say choose hope. Choose. Number two, share it with others. Say share it with others. That's what I want you to do. In the midst of whatever circumstances you find yourself in, I want you to choose hope. I want you to share it with others. Now, I want you to consider some ways that you can share hope 
with others in your life. Think about your family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbor. What are some ways that you can share that hope with them? And there may be some of you here that are running low on hope. Well, if that's the case, I want to pray for you. Let me pray for you right now. Let's pray together. Father, I know I've been long today, but God, it's a message that you have laid on my heart that I feel needs to be delivered. And we all find ourselves in a lot of different circumstances in life to where we may lose hope. Help us to rise up. Help us to realize that you're the source of all hope, that you fill us with peace and joy, that you give us that overflowing, confident hope that we need in life. Father, I pray for the one today that may be sitting here that's lost hope. Father, I just pray that you restore that hope in them as they look to you, and as they call out to you, and as they ask for your help and they ask for your strength. Reveal yourself to them. Help them to see that there is hope in the midst of their circumstances. And God, it all starts with a relationship with you. Help us to put our faith and our trust in you, the sinless Son of God. May we trust you as our Savior. May we live out our life with you as our Lord. We ask your blessings on our congregation this Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.